Anu, uh, what did you want to talk about with us today? I would love to talk with you all about what it means to be in a complex, sometimes contradictory world and try to lead a good life. I want to plug the amazing book that you had recently come out. Um, so we're going to talk about it a lot in today's episode. Would you mind showing us the name of the book and letting people know where they can find it? Sure. Beyond Guilt Trips, Mindful Travel in an Unequal World. Uh, you can find this uh, at our local bookstores at Third Place Books and at the University Bookstore on the app. Uh, you can also find this on Amazon and wherever you purchase books. Part of the success of your book is that it kind of taps into this desire to share stories, right? And that, so we're tracing our different themes, like insider, outsider, guilt, shame, um, how do we connect and come together across inequity, essentially. What do stories in your book have to do with that? And how do you think they are particularly important to the genre and mode that you're writing in for the broader audience? Telling our story or stories is really about weaving who we are in terms of belonging, worthiness, safety, shame, what does it mean to be me in the world? Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Literature, Language, Culture Dialogue Series. This is a newish series that the Department of English at the University of Washington, Seattle has started up. We're hoping to share with you all some of the amazing work our faculty, educators, students, administration are doing to affect change in the world and share their insights with us. You can keep up with the series on social media at UW underscore ENGL. That's Instagram and Twitter. On Facebook, it's the same thing, but no underscore. And then you can also find our website and links to more content in the description below. Anu, will you introduce yourself for us? Sure. Hi there. I am Anu Taranath, and I'm faculty in English and in comparative history of ideas. I've been at the UW for a while now, and I do a lot of racial equity work uh, in our communities as well. But where can people find you online? Because you offer a lot of kind of links to the outside world and maybe people want to follow up. You're most welcome to follow me on Instagram. And my handle is Dr. Let me spell it for you. D-R dot A-N-U-T-A-R-A-N-A-T-H. And my website is www.anutaranath.com. So most welcome to follow me through those avenues. So I don't find shame to be productive. I think it actually encourages people to stay in their particular mindset. But this is, I'm realizing a good opportunity to chat with you because you study shame, essentially. It makes me think of Brene Brown's work, right? Um, and you have a very clear stake in saying that as an instructor and someone who does this activist work in a daily basis, that shame can be really fraught and problematic for actually creating true social change. But what's wrong with shame? Again, your questions are just huge and mammoth because they are sorry. touching on, no, sorry at all, but they're touching on some of the most tender points, right, of our cultural discourse. I know why shame is compelling. Shame is immediate. Yeah. When I shame somebody, I have a sense that I'm right and they need to be disciplined into becoming more right. Mm -hmm. It helps me navigate my own pain and my own disappointment with perhaps this interaction or the broader scheme of the world. It's compelling. It is. It's very seductive. Um, as an educator and as a facilitator, though, while I can see shame being useful in some political spaces, in learning and teaching, shame actually evacuates our sense of being present. I can't think of anybody that I know who <clears throat> would want to be shamed. Anybody. I don't. Probably you don't either. And if I or you don't want to be shamed, and we will go through incredible lengths 
to avoid being shamed, right? Why is that a compelling strategy for teaching folks about issues of race and power and identity and history and accountability? Most of the time, folks are well-intentioned, wanting to do better, having so little tools to do so. I would like to spend my engagement with people thinking about the tools to do so part. <clears throat> Why is it that so many white people are absolutely nerve-wracked in conversations about race? It's because lots of white people have had so few conversations about race. Right? Yeah. It makes perfect sense. If you haven't talked about something so potent and alive, right? And you know that talking well means you won't be shamed, but talking poorly about it will get you shamed. Who wouldn't short circuit? So why, why isn't that true? Like, so say I'm, I'm that person who's like, yeah, but if, if the person feels shamed, they won't do it again. So you may change. Why is that not necessarily what shame is doing? Or why is that not productive? I have never been in a teaching and learning situation, either at the institution of the university or elsewhere, where people have responded well to shame. Shame actually creates more divisions within us. It creates boundaries that I will, I will put up to ensure that I feel less of what you are putting in front of me. I have never seen it actually bring folks to humility to say, teach me more. I know that one class on literatures from Kenya or a class on post-colonial Caribbean fiction or a workshop on race and equity at the county or the city or in a small organization, none of those by themselves produces equity. Yeah. They are beginnings of something larger, right? They are a place for us to slow down, plug in, share, create memory of something different than we usually do. And for me, the outcome of any of those engagements, right, is less about transformation, let's change it all within a two-hour workshop or a one-quarter yeah. class. Yeah. And it's more about, can we create a space where people are more curious leaving than when they came in with? When people yeah, yeah. have a sense of connection and community and shared, oh, you think about that too? Me too. Right. That's pretty invaluable. That to me is the beginnings of massive transformation. Social yeah. transformation is certainly rooted in our policies and procedures about X or Y, but it's very much linked with how much belonging somebody feels. Who feels yeah. worthy? Where does that worthiness come from? How much of it right. is entitlement? How much of it is actually hard won? All right. of those questions, too, I think, are what we are exploring uh, in our classrooms, whether it is the topic of our classes or not, right. right? We have so many ways of shaming, excluding, showmanship, showing how you're deficient, yeah. uh, I do it better, competitive, all of that. We have so many ways of doing yeah. any of those things sometimes all of those things all together. Right. And most of us, I think, or most of the people I know and I have interacted with, yeah. are looking to belong deeply, are looking to have a sense of purpose, yeah. are wanting to think about how their life fits into a larger story. They want to create meaning for themselves. And as folks become better at doing any of those, those, those things for themselves, you also develop the capacity to hold space for others who are doing that too. If you yeah. yourself are feeling broken, it's really hard to extend a loving ear to others, right? Yeah. So, so much of this work to me is about creating spaces where we can, in really small, intentional, 
caring ways heal some of what is happening in us. Yeah. To be able to offer some space for others as well. That yeah. is radical social justice work for me. It's radical yeah. work, right? right? It might sound small, but sometimes the radicalness is exactly in the small, intimate, right. uncelebrated moments where folks come together, where you have a moment of pause to say, wait, why was my family like that? Where did I learn? How, did, how has my miseducation shaped me? What has it yeah. meant for me to be in communities where people look like me? What is, how do I heal when I am in spaces where I don't look like the people near me? Those can be transformative questions. Yeah. Right? Yeah. One conversation at a time. And shame and blame and telling folks how wrong they are, right, is not the way to correct folks to get better. <laughs> How does your book help activists and folks who are trying to learn to do better kind of have a roadmap or some type of like reckoning with these questions of guilt, shame, uh, living well together in a very uneven society? This book gives me so much joy um, because I was able to write it in the way that I wanted. And for an academic, um, we are often taught to write in a way that replicates the conventions of our field and our discipline and our discourse. And yet my field, which I have appreciated for all the insights it has offered me, um, has not captivated me in terms of what it means to actually share information outside of the walls of the academy. And I think because my career has spanned both the institution of the university as well as lots of places outside of it, maybe more than most academics, um, I wanted to write something that really straddled a couple of these realms in a productive way. I wanted to write something accessible. I wanted to write something that had at its core stories and storytelling as a mode of teaching, learning, and inviting into conversations. I wanted to write something where people can gather, whether it's a classroom or whether it's staff at King County, where people can gather around a set of questions and talk together. So how do we talk about difficult, complex, contradictory, sometimes painful experiences about race and racism and traveling across difference and what does it mean to hold the complexity of having our hearts filled with good intentions, but knowing that what I have in my bank account is more than this entire community has. Oh, why is it that for years in my office hours, I would have students who I didn't know standing there waiting for a chance to talk to me to say, my roommate was in a class of yours or somebody I know studied abroad with you last year, and I have just come back from Peru or Kenya or Ghana. And I want to talk with you, how is it that we never talked about race on my trip? How is it we never talked about colonialism? How is it we never yeah. talked about why the world is divided the way it is? How come yeah. parts of the world look and feel different and are so under-resourced? Where did yeah. that, how did that happen? How come we never explored that in our, in our programs? Yeah. And not exploring those kinds of concepts plays out on our trips, plays out on yeah. our journeys. We have to think about this project in terms of anchoring it in the now, right? This is a time when a lot of people talk about feeling hopeless and disempowered by a global pandemic. Hope in this sense seems like a really good counterpoint to shame right? Um, a kind of something you can extend that doesn't cause people to just shut down immediately, but will maybe mobilize some different social norms to come into place. I mean, this is going to sound so cheesy. Are there formidable challenges in our lives and communities and in our world? 
Yes, undoubtedly, of course. And, and is my most favorite word. Right? Yeah. And because it helps us hold many different truths at once. So formidable complexities and challenges, yes. And in every single community that I know of, all over the world that I've had the good fortune to visit, there are people working to make life better from us. How is that possible? If not for hope, all over the world, close by and far away, there are people every day who make life better for more of us. We don't know them. You won't hear of them. You might not even meet them if you go into their communities because this isn't advertised work. It's not celebrated. It's not publicized. It's not performative in that way. It's yeah. quiet, sustainable, intentional, making life better for more of us. Great. I have seen this from rural women in a small area of South India. I have seen this all over the world, including my life here in Seattle. Yeah. Right? And understanding that I am part of a larger rhythm of pessimism sometimes that rises and ebbs and flows, but also the antidote to that is plugging into larger movements and systems of change that are happening, that are happening. Yeah. And so the more that you and I understand deeply, not just on an intellectual level, but deep in my bones, I know that there are change makers around the world. I know that. Yeah. And I can choose to belong to that. I yeah. do belong to that. And that story, that narrative is exceptionally powerful for me. The more I do this work, the more I have realized that there are innumerable ways to have power over somebody. There are innumerable ways to cause people harm, pain, and death. There are innumerable ways to suck the life out of a community. And because there are innumerable ways for all of those things, power over, there are also, I now know, innumerable ways that we work to counter that. There is not one way to do social justice work for me. Social justice work is a much broader umbrella for a wide variety of movements, protests, quiet activism, things that we do that's not even called activism. It's the wider umbrella term, right? Because power over is so multiple, our movements for love and justice and more dignity for all of us must also be multiple and rich and nuanced, right? Somebody asked me the other day, uh, you didn't go to the last big protest. I said, no, I did not. And they said, don't you feel like you're not an activist? I said, quite the contrary. Uh, I applaud folks that, go to, that went to that particular protest and I might go to the next one. But for me, activism is plugging into bigger ideas with the gifts that you have in the communities that you have. Uh, all the way from the parent who has had a terrible situation at work and comes home and chooses not to displace that anxiety and energy onto their kid. In that one moment of choice to not easily um, dispel it into that child, that to me is justice work. Yeah. It's a small moment, a small moment. It's never celebrated, right? You'll never hear about it. But thousands and thousands of times a day, we can choose where to align our values. Thousands of times a day, we can choose to either reflect on what's coming up for me in this moment, and where does that come from? And how do I want to either carry it forward or neutralize it? What does that look yeah. like? That is justice work for me. I knew, 
Thank you for being with us today. Thanks so much, C. This was great. I appreciate your time. Um, and just in case people didn't catch it at the beginning, where can people follow up with you online? Uh, you can find me at my website at www.anutharanath.com. And you can follow me on Instagram at dr.anutharanath. And if you're watching this project and you don't know this about YouTube, it helps if you give us a like and subscribe so the channel can grow and the department can share this work in a broader setting. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, reviews actually will go a long way towards helping us out. I think that's it for today. Thank you again, Anu. And I hope everyone out there has a wonderful day.